story. Tonight I want to tell you a story. Once upon a time there was a king. Yes, it's that kind of a story. The king was called Raja Bhoj. He found a throne, a throne that belonged to King Vikramaditya. It was made of gold with 32 wooden statues. The king, Raja Bhoj, wanted to sit on the throne, but he couldn't. Every time he tried, a statue came to life, one of those 32 statues, it came to life, and it stopped the king from sitting. The statue then asked him to listen to a story, a story of the glory of King Vikramaditya. Every time, there was a different story, but every story ended with the same question. Are you worthy enough to sit on the throne of the great King Vikramaditya? And every time, Raja Bhoj had the same answer. No, I'm not worthy of sitting on this throne. This happened repeatedly. The statues were impressed. They liked the humility of Raja Bhoj, so they blessed him. They let him sit on the throne of King Vikramaditya. This is a fable from the 11th century. It is called Singhasan Battisi. Singhasan means throne. Battis is 32. The title means 32 Tales of the Throne. And this wasn't just a storybook. This was a book of guidelines, a book of laws, if you like. Why am I telling you about this today? Because as we celebrate our Republic Day, the day our constitution came into force, it is important to know that books of laws or constitutions existed in ancient India. And while we may think that a constitution or a republic is a modern construct, a modern concept imported from the West, something like this existed in ancient India. Our history, in fact, is full of such stories and texts. Centuries ago, the concept of democracy existed in India. Prime Minister Modi has called India the mother of democracies. Bharat, mother of democracy. And we have also, and Bihar has also, दुनिया में दंका बजाते रहना चाहिए कि we are a mother of democracy. Today, as we celebrate Modern India's 74th Republic Day, I want to talk about books of laws and constitutions from our ancient past, as far back as the Vedic period. They had institutions like central assemblies to check the powers of the king. Books like the Rig Ved and Chandogya Upanishad talk about them. These assemblies had two houses, the Samiti, representing the whole tribe, and the Sabha, with distinguished members, a bit like the upper and lower houses of parliament today. The Mahabharat refers to Ganaraja, meaning the rule of the republic. Now, we usually think of Greece as the birthplace of modern democracy, but even Greek records talk about republics in ancient India. Greek historian Diodorus Siculus has a very interesting account. He wrote about Alexander's invasion of India, 326 B.C., Sikula said, Northwest India had republics that challenged Alexander's army. Perhaps the oldest book of laws in India is the Arthashastra, believed to have been written in the 4th century BC. The author was Kautilya, also known as Chanakya. He wrote about all aspects of governance and defined the seven elements of a state. Then there was a Dharmashastra, written around 600 BC, according to some accounts. It talks about the four different stages of a lawsuit. You file a complaint, the defendant responds, the jury deliberates, and finally the judge speaks, a lot like a modern-day court hearing. India was practicing all of this centuries ago. Then we have the Brihaspati Spriti. It talks about the hierarchy of courts, amazingly similar to modern-day legal systems. At the lowest level was the family arbitrator. Stage 2, a court with a judge. Stage 3, the court with the chief justice. And right at the top, the king's court. And the king was not the sole decision-maker. He had counsellors and judges. Their role is best described by Katyayana, a Sanskrit scholar, mathematician and priest. This is what he said. If the king wants to inflict upon the litigants an illegal or unrighteous decision, it is the duty of the judge to warn the king and prevent him. When the judge realizes that the king has deviated from equity and justice, his duty is not to please the king. For this is no occasion for soft speech. If the judge fails in his duty, he is guilty. All of this was practiced in India ages ago. In the centuries that followed, India was colonized. And after it won freedom, it wrote a new book of laws, a constitution. The year was 1949, and it was nothing short of a miracle. For a country as diverse as ours, with 88% of the population illiterate, it was a very big deal to write a constitution, and that too, the world's largest, 145,000 words. For perspective, the U.S. Constitution has 4,400 words. The Indian one has 1,45,000. 
And this was just the first version. It has been amended 100 times. It has grown bigger each time. The book is divided into articles and schedules. Articles spell out a law. Schedules give supplementary information, a, a bit like an appendix in a book. So why is our law book so big? Because we have a big, diverse country. Our difficulty is how to make the heterogeneous mess that we have today take a decision in common and march in a cooperative way on that road which is bound to lead us to unity. This was B.R. Ambedkar addressing the Constituent Assembly. What is the Constituent Assembly? The people who drafted the Constitution. And let me say this again, this was an extraordinary experiment. Today, diversity is a corporate buzzword. India aced it more than 70 years ago. This group that wrote the Constitution had 389 members from all parts of India. Then partition happened. Some went to Pakistan. 299 were left. They took three years to write the book. The original copies were not typed or printed. They were handwritten by a calligrapher called Prem Bihari Narayan Raizada. He wrote in English and Hindi, and he did it for free. What he wanted was his place in history. He wanted his name on each page of India's constitution and his grandfather's name on the last page. The book he created was a piece of art. The pages were bound in black leather, embossed with patterns of gold. Each page was decorated by artists from Shanti Niketan, led by a man called Nandlal Bose. They depicted stories from Indian history, like the Indus Valley Civilization, the struggle for independence, the Vedic period, a scene from the Mahabharat showing a discussion between Arjun and Lord Krishna. The section on fundamental rights has a sketch of Lord Ram, Sita and Lakshman returning from the Battle of Lanka. All of this is in our constitution. It features Emperor Ashok talking about Buddhism, Lakshmi Bai, Akbar, Maratha ruler Shivaji and Guru Gobind Singh, the 10th Sikh Guru. The laws in the book came from different sources, from at least 10 different countries. Principles like single citizenship, the cabinet, parliamentary system, they came from Britain. Fundamental rights, impeachment, independent judiciary came from the US. Concurrent list from Australia, directive principles from Ireland, federalism from Canada, fundamental duties from Russia, then USSR, and concepts of liberty, equality, and fraternity came from France. Imagine undertaking a task like this, curating ideas from around the globe, tailoring them to the needs of India, and building consensus in such a diverse group. I say it again, it was a miracle of sorts. Seven decades have passed, the world has changed, India has changed, it has made long strides. Today our constitution is criticized for its length and for how complicated the text is. Well, some criticisms are valid. But when you look at the context, how this text came into being and how it stood the test of time, you're awed by the story of this book. And when you rewind further, you realize that our present constitution is not our first. We've had books of laws and republics and democratic institutions long before we started looking west for inspiration.